Good morning. Welcome to Trinity's online service. And have a great day today. Thank you, Don and Jim, for that welcome. I'm Pastor Bruce Todd, and I also welcome you to this 19th weekend after Pentecost as we observe Harvest Home Sunday on our online worship. For Harvest Home Sunday, you still are able to participate by bringing offerings to the church for our drive-through offering of non-perishable food items between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock this Sunday morning. We will be offering our Zoom communion at 10.30 on Sunday morning. We apologize for the technical problems last week. Some of you were able to get in, but some of you, the link changed in the middle of it, but you will be receiving a new email with a new link. And we encourage you to invite family and friends to join us for any of our worship opportunities, as well as listen on our radio broadcast at Word FM, Great Songs of the Faith at 97.1 on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We continue to offer Faith at Four, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at four o'clock on Trinity's Facebook page, where you can have a devotional message by one of our staff members or a member of the congregation. We continue to offer Wednesday Bible studies, both Wednesday morning and Wednesday evening, led by our seminarian, Amy Smith. If you would like to participate in our Bible study, uh, simply leave a voicemail at the office at 215-368-1710 or send an email to tlc at trinitylansdale.com. All Saints Sunday is November 1st. We continue to appreciate your support in participating in our programs and in your prayers, as well as your financial offerings. We encourage you to support us financially, either electronically or on our website, or mailing your offerings to 1000 West Main Street here in Lansdale. Let us begin our worship with our Harvest Home Litany. Oh God, you have blessed the works of our hands and given us the abundance of the fruits of the earth. We humbly give you thanks for providing us with the bread of life to nourish our bodies and souls. Give us grace to share the same with those in need. But what can we bring? We bring our gratitude for God's grace and generosity shown to us throughout this year. What can we bring? We bring our love, our compassion, our energy, and commitment. What can we bring? We bring our common humanity, our being of one body with all God's children throughout the world. What can we bring? We bring our determination to share the fruits of the earth more equally. What can we bring? We bring bread torn into fragments, the bread of life offered for the pain of the world. What can we bring? We bring our whole selves to worship you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue with our opening hymn.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. O Lord, maker of all things, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living creature. We praise you for crowning the fields with your blessings and enabling us once more to gather in the fruits of the earth. Teach us to use your gifts carefully, that our land may continue to yield its increase. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the reading. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seeds to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for every great generosity which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confessions of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Today, I would like to tell you a story from the Gospel of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the wheats of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hi there, everybody. How you doing, kids? I was just sitting here staring at all these things that have suddenly arrived in our chancel area at church. Can you see them? 
I, I just done it, it's like, a food cupboard or something. If you look around, you can see, oh, look at, there's a big horn. I think they call it a cornucopia. Can you say that? That's a big word if you can learn that. Cornucopia, cornucopia. That means this big horn. You can't play music out of it, but it's full often of vegetables, fruits, and foods that are from the harvest. The harvest that comes when the farmer's fields are ripe and the trees and all are ready to be picked and bringing in all the food. Now, why is food sitting in front of our altar? We've got not just things that are grown outside in the ground, like, oh, let's see, what grows in the ground? Can you tell me anything? Well, we've got cornflakes, and corn is growing in the fields. So cornflakes is something that came from outside. And we got apple, cinnamon, Quaker oatmeal. That's from the trees, from the trees. And then we've got, um, let's see, spaghetti, prego over here. Ooh, I bet you like that. And that, what's that got to do with outside? I know, tomatoes. Tomatoes make the sauce. So the whole harvest is coming here and the foods are from all the things we grow in the fields and some more that aren't even there. But it's been lovely to see all kinds of food. We even have exotic, look at this, we've got pineapple. I think pineapple grows in Hawaii. That's pretty far from here. So I think somebody named Cricket, Cricket, is a member here and she has been kind of in charge of seeing that all these beautiful foods from the harvest come in for Harvest Home Sunday. That's a day when lots of people um, will take these foods out in the community and they will distribute it to people who don't have enough food at home. I, uh, I hope if any of you need it, you would be willing to tell us so we could help you out. Because sometimes people, they don't want to tell anybody that they can't afford to buy enough for their family. And that should never be, that should never be. People should take care of each other and not be ashamed or embarrassed. Things happen sometimes. Sometimes you have to help another person with food and then they'll help you sometime when you might need something. That's the way God likes it. So anyway, it's a celebration and you have time still to bring food in. Today is the last day, uh, Sunday, that you bring in the collection. So I hope you got it here pretty much already. But thanks for what you've done for your family, your moms and dads and grandparents and such. And I think there's something to remember before I go. There's a sign back here. It says, next time you're hungry, and you say, I'm starving, when you probably just had your lunch and it's only an hour later. Think about people who are really starving. And believe it or not, there are those people in our community here. They're not just all across the world, far away, right here at home. People need our help. And Trinity's gonna do a little something to make a difference. Thanks everybody, and thanks kids. I hope you too will help see, serve those who are in need all the time. Bye-bye. Today I am going to read a little different thing than the gospel. Uh, I'm going to make a choice myself to read the, the lesson from Philippians chapter four, verses one through nine. And Paul writes, my dear friends, my dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy. Fill me with such pride. Don't waver. Stay on track, steady in God. I urge Euodia and Syntyche to iron out their differences and to make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. And oh yes, Sizgus, since you are right there to help them work things out, do your best with them. These women worked for the message hand in hand with Clement and me, says Paul, and with other veterans. They worked as hard as any of us. Remember their names are also in the book of life. 
Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Jesus, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness and everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. Our good and gracious God, we come to you this day with all kinds of worries and concerns on our minds uh, for our country, for the world, for friends, relatives, to stay healthy, to heal if they have become sick with the virus. We pray for discoveries to uh, put that virus away and just uh, defeat its power in our world. We ask that we can also uh, be especially uh, careful and, and helpful to those who may be sick, to encourage them, strengthen them, remember them, and for those who have had losses of family members, that we will also support and remind them there is a promise in Easter that one day we'll all be together again. Help us in the work we do day in and day out for you, for our families, for the world. And we pray, Lord, that you will be at the head of our table every day. And we thank you for life itself. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I wondered if you knew the old children's poem. It goes like this. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was horrid. Now some of you, if I could see you, would be looking at me with blank stares. Where on earth did she get that? <laughs> it's from my childhood, I don't remember where. Others of you will giggle and start to remember who first taught you this crazy little poem. And still others may bring into focus one or two testy childhood female playmates who could star in this little rhyme. These companions could be headstrong and want their way all the time. From hopscotch to making and dressing up the snowman. Well, of course, we consider ourselves to be the patient, flexible, mature Christian friend, right? Now, I realize my attempt to typecast any of you will be dangerous. So where am I going with this nursery rhyme? Well, it came to mind because our lesson from Philippians today is about two rare exceptional missionaries who are causing some pressing concerns in their community. Up until now, they have been rock stars and trailblazers with the Apostle Paul and with other brave evangelists in Philippi. But you see, the rare fact is these co-workers of Paul's are female. Yes, they're women. They're women missionaries going throughout the countryside. They have preached and taught boldly about Jesus in the public square or secluded highways along the way. Alongside, you mind, mind you, Paul and the other male evangelists. For long periods of time, they have been out on the road or in the cities. Now their names are 
uncommon and not easy to pronounce, namely Euodia and Sinkachi. But unfortunately, Paul gives us no real facts, no descriptions of their call to mission work with him. We only hear in today's lesson, sadly, that they have become now the problem, not the solution in their local church. How is that? Well, they've had some conflict or hurt feelings between themselves. Imagine that. Two evangelists getting into some sort of a quarrel, and now they're not even speaking to each other. Oh, now we can't pretend that we haven't been a little bit in those shoes on occasion ourselves. None of us is perfect, but they get written up in the scripture when they have an argument. And the church's mission will suffer a little bit because of this, you know, as do our churches nowadays. When fellow Christians are quarreling within a congregation, when they form cliques or choose, quote, sides and become estranged from parts of the congregation or the staff, who wants to be part of such a congregation then, after all? So Paul, who is now in prison in Rome, facing certain death in the long run, is writing this epistle back to those people in Philippi. A letter from his jail cell, in other words, is composed and sent to home base. Why? To urge these gifted women, his dear, dear friends and fellow evangelists to make amends for the sake of the gospel and splitting up their current church family. After all, they have such a wonderful reputation. They'd worked so hard to spread the good news of Christ alongside the men. But now they must also model his grace, his free, undeserved gift of forgiveness and love, and his hope and healing power for their community. He reminds these women, Paul, to use their gifts for building up, not infecting the church family. As it says in our little nursery rhyme, yes, but when they were good, they were very, very good. But when they were bad, they were horrible. So Paul invites in our lesson today another co-worker in the congregation with another whopper of a name, Syzygos. He's the right man in the community, in the church family, to work with the women, to bring healing from their division. And Paul phrases, appraises their ability in the mission field, saying, you know, they worked as hard as any of us. Remember their names also in the book of life. But even the best believer among us needs the intervention once in a while, don't we, of a brother or sister in Christ to remind us to lay down our grudges, our complaining, our misunderstandings about another church family member, or sometime one who sees our divisions and backbiting and will never want to be part of the fellowship that we are leading. You know what I mean, don't you? Now, I'm certain most of us can remember a time or are still caught up in one when committees in our church, from circle projects to daring stewardship campaigns to chancel renovation plans and building campaigns that were very, very novel, when we were active, maybe in one of those many committees, we started out well enough didn't we? Oh, it's fun to meet new people. We didn't know everybody. Discover their gifts and their opinions. Dream dreams of what we could do or build or do in the community for people. Then all of a sudden, a decision comes along and we don't agree. We have a variety of opposing ideas, in fact. What color the carpet should be in the chancel? Where to put the baptismal font? Up front here, in the middle, on the side. 
What type of upholstery and color should we put as pew cushions or chairs, if any? And you know where this is going, don't you? Conversations then begin to get a little animated in committee meetings and opinions start to clash and feelings are bruised and you lose one or two committee members along the way who just say it's not worth it. And yes, I'm sorry to say, even the pastor gets caught up sometimes in the crossfire and the crosshairs of the committee squabbles. And then Paul has a word of wisdom and healing for us all. As the Message Bible would say it, don't fret or worry when this thing comes along. Instead of worrying, pray. Let your petitions and your praises shape your worries into prayers, says Paul, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness and everything coming together for good will begin to settle down the troubles in your midst. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worries at the center of your life with peace and hope and joy. Catholic author Henry Nouwen has used a wise phrase for us today. He says, pay attention to the people God puts in your path if you want to discern what God is up to in your life. Let me say that again. Pay attention to the people God puts in your path if you want to discern what God is up to in your life. Maybe there's a message there. Maybe the women in this missionary team need also to hear that phrase. Who are they having put in their path to bring hope and healing and new beginnings to their ministry? We all have had fallen short, haven't we, of what we are meant to be even in community, in families, in relations with relatives. And the corona pandemic has made it very dicey in our time, much more complicated, with fears now that separate us, and isolation for many at home who are just tired of having to be limited. It makes it so difficult to be joyful and to care for others. We are all on edge at times. And the fear of getting that COVID-19 disease is a daily reality for us all. And simultaneously, <laughs> oh my, aren't we longing for some fellowship? We're longing for the good old days. We're longing to be able to sit in the church pews together and sing songs and carols. We're longing for good news in the nightly news on that television set, right? Something has been found. We are turning the corner. Really good news. But it goes on, it seems, and even mounts higher, the statistics of loss. People are dying, and we cannot give them even a festive celebration and appreciation for their lives. I think of the recent loss of Supreme Court Justice also, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, ever so popular with all generations, even the younger generation. We said a brief goodbye to her in these last weeks, but she has a bit of advice for us today that sounds for all the world like a preacher. She said, if you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside of yourself. Something to repair tears in your community. Something to make life a little better for people. People less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is. Living not for oneself, but for one's community. Our missionary women have done that. They've lived for community, and now they're in a time of need and conflict. I'm sure that they resolved it in time. It's been 
2,000 years or so since it happened. And yet, don't we have the same problem still today over and over again? And so I close with Paul's advice to his dear community of Philippi in these words. He says, finally, my beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And I know that the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Now let us continue with the hymn of the day. Let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. 
Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, and still the running waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the effort of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see to their needs. We pray especially for Al Morris, Carolyn Levera Wolf, Leon Strohecker, Craig Newberger, our President and First Lady, and all our elected officials who join others who are suffering from COVID 19. Those listed on our prayer list, and all those we name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, you give us more than we need with the expectation that we share with others. On this Harvest Home Sunday, we give thanks for the bountiful blessings you bestow on us. Help us to be faithful to your calling to care for the poor and needy by sharing from the abundance we have. Help us to be cheerful givers, knowing that we are doing your work in this land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God to enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue now with the offering.
Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and hear us as we pray. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.